So we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts and minds would be pleasing, acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. It's in the name of Jesus, the one who is the living word that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Friends, you may be seated. So it's become a family tradition. It began five years ago when Elizabeth and I and Naraya and Rena, Micaiah was not born, moved to Plano, Texas. It's a family tradition that began because we finally moved out of Sioux County and now could watch movies on Sundays. Just kidding. Every Sunday night we began to have family movie night. This has been our practice for five years now. At the time, Nariah was six, Rena was three, we did not yet have Micaiah, but it's something that our children have come to eagerly anticipate every single week. As parents, of course, we've become even more keenly aware of ratings for movies, the movies which we show our children. Uh, way back in 1922, a man by the name of William Hayes formed what was called the Motion Pictures Distributor Association of America, today known as the Motion Picture Association of America. And just eight years after forming this organization, William Hayes began to devise a moral censorship code for all movies produced in the United States. It was called the Hayes System. William Hayes would retire from his position in the 1940s, but his code for moral censorship would take us all the way up to 1968, when the new president of the MPAA named Jack Valente created a new system for rating movies. Some of you who were around back in the late 60s may remember that all movies were categorized according to four labels. G for general, M for mature audiences, R for restricted, and X for no one 17 and under. Later on, M rated, mature rated movies, were changed to PG-rated movies. Apparently, we had too many young ones saying, I'm mature, I can handle this. And so they changed the rating to parental guidance, PG. In 1984, parental guidance 13 was established as a rating. In 1990, NC-17 replaced the X-rated version. Now, as parents, Elizabeth and I have been paying attention to the ratings for the movies of our children. We prefer to show them G-rated or general audience rated movies. According to the MPAA, this signifies that the film rated contains nothing most parents, most parents, will consider offensive for even their youngest child to see or to hear. Every once in a while, we'll let them watch a PG rated movie. Parental guidance suggested. Some material may not be suitable for children. Signifies that the film rated may contain some material parents might not like to expose their children to. This is usually where we stop, but if you move on to the PG-13 rating, parents are strongly cautioned. Some material may be inappropriate for children under 13. I remember turning 13 and I thought I was in the money. Rough or persistent violence is absent. Sexually oriented nudity is generally absent. But some scenes of drug use may be seen. Some use of harsher, sexually derived, used words may be heard. And then I turned 17, and I got to watch R-rated movies. R-rated movies simply means that under 17 requires an accompanying parent or adult who is at least 21. The film may contain adult material, including coarse language, violence, sex, and drug use. And then, of course, we have NC-17. No one 17 and under admitted content that is patently adult, including explicit sexual scenes, an accumulation of sexually oriented language, and or scenes of excessive violence. This is our rating system today. So this means that on Sunday nights, the Hardeman family movie nights, Kit Kittridge, rated G, totally appropriate. Uh, but Caddyshack, not so much. The Hardeman Family Movie Night, we allow our daughters to watch Monsters, Inc., very appropriate, G-rated film, but uh, The Matrix, uh, not so much, rated R. Hardeman Family Movie Night, Toy Story 2, one of my own personal favorites in the G-rated category, okay. Terminator 2, not so much. But here's the question for you this morning. 
How would you rate the Bible? I remember as a freshman at Northwestern College uh, taking the Reverend Dr. Raymond Weiss's uh, Bib Faith class. It was in the first level of Impersum Hall over on Northwestern College's campus. And I remember sitting there, and it was the very first time, despite having been raised in the church all my life, despite having attended Christian schools all the way through 12th grade, it was the first time that anyone had ever given me the assignment to read Genesis all the way through, straight through. And so I did so, and I remember sitting in a study cubicle in the basement of old Heemstra Hall because I was a studious person, reading through the entire book of Genesis, and I remember trying to pick my jaw off of the table as it dropped every single time. I read these stories, and I'd come back to Dr. Weiss's class, and together we'd debrief. In fact, I remember one entire class period, Dr. Weiss allowed us simply to vent, to simply try to come to terms with the fact that these were not the stories that appeared on the flannel graph board in the Sunday school classroom of the basement of the Lighten Christian Reformed Church. These were not the stories that got printed in Sunday school materials. These were the stories that had R-rated and even NC-17-rated material. We've been journeying through the book of Ruth together. We began several weeks ago. You may remember that the story of Ruth begins in a not-so-hopeful tone. You may remember that the patriarch of the family, Elimelech, has a wife named Naomi. They have two sons, Malon and Kilion, and there's a famine in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, which in Hebrew means house of bread. There's no bread in Bethlehem. And so Elimelech uproots his family, and together they move to Moab. It's in Moab where Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, dies. Her two sons, Malon and Kilion, actually take Moabite wives named Orpah and Ruth. Then Malon and Kilion also die, no offspring, and Ruth and Naomi and Orpah decide to return to Naomi's homeland, to Bethlehem, back to the house of bread. For Naomi had heard that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So they, they uprooted themselves once again. They packed their bags. They made their way back to Bethlehem. And it's somewhere between mile marker 1 and mile marker 55 that they decide that, well, Naomi decides this is not a good idea to take these two foreign daughters-in-law back with her. And so she tells them to return to Moab. Orpah does that. Ruth sticks to her mother-in-law as a sign of God's covenantal chesed, God's faithfulness. Ruth decides to hitch herself to the hapless, hopeless cause of her mother-in-law. They, they return to Bethlehem. We learned the second week, the third week of our sermon series, we, we learned that they return to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So in other words, in, in a story that has so much despair, so much dejection, so much despondency, we begin to see hope as they return to the beginning of the barley harvest. And it's when they return to Bethlehem that Ruth, the Moabite daughter-in-law, decides to go to one of the fields where she decides to take advantage of the Deuteronomic Code and the Levitical Law. Deuteronomic Code and Levitical Law that allowed widows and orphans and aliens and strangers to glean in the fields behind the reapers. Ruth does this, and Ruth, she must have caught the eye of a prominent rich man named Boaz. Boaz, who we learn is actually related to Naomi, or actually to Elimelech, Naomi's dead husband. Boaz takes note of Ruth. He takes so much note of her, in fact, that he gives her all kinds of grain. On this one day of harvesting, the, the typical wage for a laborer was about two pounds of barley, and Ruth is given somewhere between 20 and 30 pounds of barley to take back, to take back to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And when she does so, Naomi is amazed by this and asks who took notice of her. And it's there where Ruth names the name Boaz, the strong one, the prominent rich man. And immediately upon hearing that name, Naomi recognizes that the hand of the Lord has not turned against her, but for her, towards her. She realizes that in naming Boaz's name that God has not forsaken the living or the dead, has not forsaken Elimelech, has not forsaken Malon or Kilion. And last week, we heard how this story, the story of redemption, is a scandalous story. It's a story that involves Naomi dressing up, dolling up her daughter-in-law Ruth to go down to the threshing floor. The threshing floor where, where the laborers were tarred, where they worked up a sweat, where, where after working they would often drink and have enjoy a meal together. 
And it's after Boaz's inhibitions are lowered that Ruth comes to him and decides to uncover his lower half. Boaz wakes up after passing out and recognizes that this young woman is laying next to him. This young woman named Ruth. And it's at that point in the story where Boaz says that he will he will take care of Ruth if there is no one else to take care of her. And this is where the story picks up for us this morning. Uh, Ruth chapter 4, it begins PG, I'll warn you, when we get to the NC-17 uh, part, uh, listener discretion is advised. We begin, Ruth 4, verses 1 through 12, listen for the word of the Lord. No sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there than the next of kin of whom Boaz had spoken came passing by. So Boaz said, come over here, friend, sit down. And he went over and sat down. Then Boaz took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. He then said to the next of kin, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me so that I may know, for... There is no one prior to you to redeem it, and I come after you. So he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. At this, the next of kin said, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. So, when the next of kin said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself, he took off a sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malon, to be my wife, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance, in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. Then all the people who were at the gate, along with the elders, said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children in Ephrathah and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give to you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It seems to me that there are four movements in this story this morning. Two characters and two pronouncements. First, there's Boaz the broker. Second, there's so-and-so, the not-so-interested. Third, there's the proclamation. And fourth, there's the prayer. We begin with Boaz the broker. Did you notice how our story began? No sooner had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there than the next of kin of whom Boaz had spoken came passing by. No sooner. Those words are in bold italics because this is the exact same Hebrew phrase that appeared earlier in Ruth chapter 2. You remember that phrase a couple of weeks ago? That phrase when Ruth is going out to the field to glean, her mother-in-law offers the blessing, and she goes out to the field to glean, and that phrase in the Hebrew that was translated, as it happened, remember how we had that, that sense, that feeling that the narrator was speaking with a bit of sarcasm, that, that underneath the, the by chance or the by happenstance translated here in the Hebrew, that underneath the providential hand of God was at work, the very same words appear here. No sooner or by chance, by happenstance, the narrator, winking as he or she writes, says, had Boaz gone up to the gate and sat down there, that the next of kin, by chance, by happenstance, of whom Boaz had spoken came passing by. And so Boaz says, come over, friend, sit down here. Now truth be told, I love the new revised standard version of the Bible, I love the fact that we pastor a church that uses the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. I believe it to be authentic to the Hebrew and the Greek. It's my favorite translation. It's one of the best parts of being your pastors. But here's the truth of the matter. The word, the Hebrew word that's translated friend here, well, here I think the New Revised Standard misses the mark terribly. You see, the word translated friend here is actually two Hebrew words. It's an idiom 
that actually means so-and-so. Come over, so-and-so. Notice, Boaz does not call this man by his name. He knew his name. Bethlehem was not a large city. He knew his name because he was part of his family. But Boaz doesn't call him by his name. In fact, he seems to treat him with disdain. He has no dignity for this man. I mean, Boaz was, after all, a prominent rich man. Boaz was a man who had clout and power. He was a man of of some stature and standing in Bethlehem. When Boaz spoke, people listened. When Boaz said jump, people asked, how high? And here it is where Boaz reaches this kinsman, this one who is next in line, and says, come over here, so-and-so, sit down here. And -and so-and-so does so. He listens to Boaz. Then Boaz takes charge of ten men of the elders of the city and says, sit down here. And so they sat down. Notice, Boaz does not send an email, does not schedule a meeting, does not use doodle to discover who can attend and who can't. No, when Boaz takes charge, people oblige. And then he says to the next of kin, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our kinsman Elimelech. What's going on here? I thought that when Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem, they had nothing. They had nothing to their name. After all, this is why Ruth gets sent out to the field to glean as one of the poor and the oppressed, as one of the widows, the orphans, as one of the strangers, the aliens within the land. What's going on here? Why is it that that the Bible references, that Boaz references, that Naomi owns land. Well, here's what happened. Several years earlier, perhaps 10 to 12 years earlier, when Elimelech lived in the land of Bethlehem, he owned a parcel of land. A parcel of land that he farmed. And the produce of that farm sustained his family. Now, when the famine came, that land did not produce any longer. And so, so Elimelech uproots his family, uproots Naomi, Malon, and Kilion, and they go to Moab. Now, for several years, this didn't matter. Nobody had interest in farming this land. It wasn't going to produce anything. But after, according to the Bible, after the Lord had considered His people and given them food, when the land began to produce again, more than likely, Elimelech, or at least Naomi and her two sons and her two daughters-in-law, who were living in Moab, they were back there. When the land began to produce, someone else overtook Elimelech's land, squatter's rights, and they began to farm it. So when Naomi comes back to Bethlehem, she has first right at being able to buy back the land from the person who is now farming it and has claimed it as his own. She has rights. There's only one problem. Naomi has no capital to invest. And there's no banker in any banker's right mind who is going to lend her the money to do so. She has no way to purchase it back. And so what she needs, quite frankly, is another patriarch, another man who has some wealth, who has some standing to buy it for her. So Boaz says this. He says, so I thought I would tell you of it. He's speaking to so-and-so again. And say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me so that I may know, for there is no one prior to you to redeem it, and I come after you. Redeem redeemed, redeeming. The word appears eight times. Eight times in Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Eight times we hear the word redeem. Now, Lori Daly did a great job of helping the kids understand a little bit of what this means. The the Hebrew word is ga'al, and there are three translations for redeem. The first is deliver, save, redeem. I remove an object from a dangerous situation as an extension of being redeemed from indenture or slavery. That's the first translation. The second, redeemed, pertaining to an object or a person who has been delivered from danger by being purchased from indenture or slavery with a focus on the relationship to a new master. Note, often in the context, this is in relationship of salvation to the Lord. And then the third definition, the one that I think it it gets to the heart of what we're seeing happen here in Ruth chapter 4, to buy back or to redeem, to purchase back an item or a person with money or goods that had been sold at a prior time. To buy back or to redeem. To purchase back an item or person with money or goods that had been sold at a prior time. So Boaz offers so and so. Listen, there's a piece of land. You want to buy it back? It belongs to Elimelech. It belongs to Naomi. You want to buy it back? And what does so and so, the not so interested, say? He says, sure. 
Of course, this is in my economic best interest. Yes, of course, I will redeem it. But then notice the catch. Boaz continues. Then Boaz says, The day you acquire the field from the hand of Naomi, you are also acquiring Ruth the Moabite. Throw that little add-on in there. Ruth the Moabite, the stranger, the alien, the one who is not a Hebrew. Oh yeah, you get the land, but you get, you get the girl too. Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead man, to maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance. And at this, the next of kin, so-and-so says, I cannot redeem it for myself without damaging my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. All of a sudden, he begins to retreat from the deal. Why? Because it's not about him. You see, this is a, an ethic of grace that pervades this transaction. Boaz is clearly outlining the opportunity for so-and-so. He's saying, listen, there's this piece of land, a parcel of land. It belonged to Elimelech. It now belongs to Naomi. You can acquire it. You can buy it. Oh yeah, but you're going to have Ruth the Moabite. And so-and-so, so-and-so isn't interested. You know why? Because it's really not going to be so-and-so's land. It's really going to be the land of Elimelech and Malon and Kilion of Naomi and Ruth and by extension Orpah. And all of a sudden, when it's not about so-and-so, he retreats from the deal. He backs away from the table. He's not interested any longer. He says, I can't redeem it. It's going to damage my own reputation. If I marry a Moabite woman, if I marry Ruth, if I take her as my own, this isn't good for me. Now, this was the custom. In former times in Israel, concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction, the one took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the next of kin said to Boaz, acquire it for yourself, he took off his sandal. He's no longer interested. And so then Boaz has a proclamation. Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, all the witnesses, today you are witnesses that I have acquired from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to who? To Elimelech. And all that belonged to who? Kilion. And Malon. I have also acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malon, to be my wife, to maintain. Why? To maintain the dead man's name on his inheritance, in order that the name of the dead may not be cut off from his kindred and from the gate of his native place. Today you are witnesses. Do you see the grace of God? Do you see the covenantal chesed, the faithfulness of God in the midst of the story? God has not forgotten or forsaken the living or the dead. Boaz has come to redeem it. To be sure, there is, there is a love interest here. To be sure, Boaz's hormones were raging down on the threshing floor back in Ruth chapter 3. But he's doing the dignified thing. Not by taking Ruth for himself and for his own good. No, by taking this land and taking Ruth for the sake of Elimelech and Naomi and Malon and Ruth and Kilion and Orpah. He is honoring both the living and the dead. This is a transaction of grace. And notice the prayer. What do the townspeople do? Then all the people who were at the gate along with the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. Rachel and Leah make up, they're, they're the mothers of eight of the tribes of Israel. Eight of them. Rachel and Leah married to Jacob. Jacob kind of got connived in the midst of this deal. Kind of fitting because Jacob in the Bible is a little bit of a conniver. He gets connived by his father-in-law Laban who is supposed to give him Rachel, but first gives him Leah and then gives him Rachel. May, may, may the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah. In other words, may Ruth bear offspring. Not just one or two, but multiple offspring who together built up the house of Israel. May you produce children in Ephrathah and bestow a name in Bethlehem. And through the children that the Lord will give to you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. And that last line should be, well, hyperlinked to a prior story. Who is Perez? Who is Tamar? Who is Judah? Listener discretion, reader discretion, be advised. We are entering into the R-rated section of the story. This story hyperlinks back to Genesis chapter 38. Listen to this story. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and settled near a certain Oldamite whose name was Hira. 
There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He married her and went into her. She conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. Again she conceived and bore a son whom she named Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she named him Shelah. She was in Chizeb when she bore him. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Don't mess with God. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. Raise up offspring for your brother. In Old Testament times, it was common that if the firstborn died, was married to a woman, that then the secondborn would be offered to produce offspring, not for the secondborn, but for the firstborn, to maintain Ur's name. So he offers the second son. Go into her. Perform the duty of a brother-in-law. Raise up offspring for your brother. But since Onan knew that the offspring would not be his... He spilled his semen on the ground whenever he went into his brother's wife so that he would not give offspring to his brother. What he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Again, don't mess with God. Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. He's got three boys. Ur didn't end so well. Onan didn't end so well. Shelah... He's going to be a little bit hesitant to give Sheila to Tamar. Tamar's like the black widow spider. She kills everyone that she comes into contact with. So then Judah says to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Sheila grows up, for he feared that he too would die like his brothers. So Tamar went to live in her father's house. Story continues. In course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. Judah is now a widower. When Judah's time of mourning was over, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers. He and his friend Hira the Aldamite. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she put off her widow's garments, put on a veil, wrapped herself up, and sat down at the entrance to Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. She saw that Sheila was grown up, yet she had not been given to him in marriage. Tamar is smart. She understands that this boy whom she was supposed to be given in marriage Produce offspring? Has not, that's not been done. Story continues, when Judah saw her, he thought her to be a prostitute, for she had covered his, her face. He went over to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come in me? He answered, I will send you a kid from the flock. And she said, only if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and the staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she got up and went away, taking off her veil. She put on the garments of her widowhood. When Judah sent the kid by his friend, the Aldamite, to recover the pledge from the woman, he could not find her. He asked the townspeople, where is the temple prostitute who was at Nahum by the wayside? But they said, no prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Moreover, the townspeople said, no prostitute has been here. Judah replied, uh, let's keep this thing as her, let her keep this thing as her own. Otherwise, we will be laughed at, you see. I sent this kid and you could not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the whore. Moreover, she is pregnant as a result of whoredom. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Oh, the hypocrisy. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law. It was the owner of these who made me pregnant. And she said, take note, please, whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah acknowledged them and said, she is more in the right than I. No kidding. She is more in the right than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila, and he did not lie with her again. When the time of her delivery came, there were twins in her womb. While she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and bound his hand, a crimson thread, saying, this one came out first, but just then drew back his hand, and out came the brother, and she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, he was named Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the crimson thread on his hand, and he was named Zira. So back to Ruth chapter 4. What do the townspeople pray? May you produce children in Ephrathah and bestow a name in Bethlehem and through the children that the Lord will give you by this young woman, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. 
And if you fast forward in the genealogy, now these are the descendants of Perez. Perez became the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram of Aminadab. Aminadab of Na- Nashon. Nashon of Salmon. And Salmon of Boaz. So who was Perez? Perez was Boaz's great, 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 great grandfather. He was the illegitimate child of Tamar, who happened to be the daughter-in-law of Judah, whom Judah slept with when he thought she was a prostitute. Who was Tamar? Tamar was Boaz's great, 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 great grandmother. She was widowed twice before being cast away as a curse by her father-in-law. She took matters into her own hands by sleeping with her father-in-law. Who was Judah? Boaz's great, 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 great grandfather. Why? Because we're convinced, we're convinced that so many of us keep the Bible at arm's length because number one, we treat it as a reference textbook. And number two, because we think that we can't relate to the characters within. We look at all the characters of our Bibles with an airbrush. Perfect people who had all their stuff together. And the reason we share the story of Ruth is because it's a story we're convinced that we can find ourselves in. What am I saying this morning? None of us are beyond the pale of God's grace. None of us are beyond the pale of God's redemptive purposes. If God can do it for Judah and Tamar, He can do it for you and for me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give You thanks for the gift of Your Word. We pray that You would inspire these words in our hearts and minds, that indeed the story of Ruth would be a story in which we can find ourselves. A story in which we do not hide those parts of our past that we want to keep secret, but a story in which we know that You call those stories to light. You unearth them to show us how You can bring about redemptive purposes in Your world. Thank You, O God, for Boaz and for Ruth, for Naomi and Orpah, For these are the characters who more than we like to admit resemble our very own lives. Thank you, O God, for the gift of Jesus who brings us ultimate redemption and forgiveness of sin. It's in his name we pray and all God's people said, amen.